Good to go when you are, Tom. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us in this fourth and final webinar in the series on facilitating community participation in core projects. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging and extend our respects to anybody who might be attending and to acknowledge that much of the work that our organisation does, all the work our organisation does is on traditional lands that were never ceded. Um, so this webinar today is going to be on um, facilitating community participation through the community engagement activities. We're le we've left the, what is perhaps the most obvious um, aspect uh, till last. Um, uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, I, we also need to acknowledge um, the sustainability of Victoria for making these webinars possible. Um, and, and this is uh, important to acknowledge this is a, an initiative under the, the Community Power Hub program. Um, a little bit of housekeeping uh, will, as with the previous webinars, we'll take questions as we go. There are going to be several points during um, during the presentation where we will pause for, for questions and we'll deal with those at that time. If, of course, there's a question which is what I would call a blocker, you're preventing your understanding of what we're talking about, um, I may, I may um, interrupt Jara and, and ask a clarification question. Um, so familiarise yourselves with the uh, with the Q and A feature of the of the webinar, um, and do also feel free to use the chat if you've got any thoughts or comments that you want to share with with everybody else. So um, over to you, Jara. Great. Thanks, Tom, and thanks everyone for joining us in the fourth of the fourth fourth webinar of the series, um, purposefully leaving the most obvious um, to last. So often when we think about um, community participation, our mind would go immediately to community engagement activities. Um, and that's what we'll be exploring tonight, is the, the range of community engagement activities that community-owned renewable energy projects, or CORE as the acronym, um, that community-owned renewable energy projects use throughout their projects. So this week, um, focusing on how you can facilitate participation through community engagement activities. Um, and of course, community engagement is a form of participation, but it's also a pathway to recruiting people to participate in other aspects of the project, in the aspects of the project that we've covered in the previous week, um, such as the governance structures and the economic arrangements. So um, community engagement is about those efforts that are made to reach out and involve people um, and engage people with the project. And community energy is fundamentally about engaging people, about making sure there's opportunities for people to be involved. Um, and finding those ways to bring people in, to reach out to that community of people that you're seeking to involve and benefit and empower through the project. So what we'll be covering tonight, um, it follows the same format as the last three webinars. So I'll do a quick recap of the last, um, the content that we've covered to date, just in case people um, are unfamiliar with that content, just to bring people up to speed, um, and just a bit of a refresh in our minds. Then I'll talk through um, community engagement activities, so we'll, we'll have a brief look at what um, community can mean, the different things it can mean, um, what I mean by community engagement, um, the different types of activities that can be encompassed within the phrase community engagement. Um, and how you might think about different types of activities by the different project stages within a community energy project. Then we'll get into some case study examples. Um, and as with previous weeks, I'll be drawing mostly on four 
um, community-owned wind energy projects, and that's because this research draws from my PhD thesis, and those were the four projects that I did a really deep dive into and, and know a lot of detail about. But also um, looking to bring in examples from other other projects as well, and particularly the work of the community power hubs, because they have done a lot in this space. Um, so we'll go through a range of different types of community engagement activities and different examples, and then um, we'll end with with a summary of the series and just some sort of key take home points. Um, we'll break the question and answer three times. So sorry, this, one of the Q and A sessions is missing, but basically at the end of each section, we'll break for for a Q and A. Um, and all going well, we'll also break for five for five minutes. Um, roughly around the midway point so that we can all get a drink of water or whatever we need. So just in terms of a really quick recap of the last three webinars, what we're looking at um, are the ways that participation um, brings value into community-owned renewable energy projects. And a lot of what drives community energy groups to pursue renewable energy projects is a whole range of motivations that are represented in this diagram. Um, and, and quite a number of those motivations are to do with the social outcomes that you're wanting to achieve through a project. So um, things around empowerment and education and capacity building and building that sense of community. And ideally your project will be able to translate these motivations into outcomes that you're able to achieve um, the things that you really wanted to achieve. But as we know, um, a lot of the things we hope to achieve are not automatic outcomes of our projects. Um, they don't always happen. They certainly don't happen automatically. So this webinar series is really about thinking through how we can design our community-owned renewable energy projects to build in strong participation, to make sure the participation happens because that participation is um, the foundation of those social outcomes. <clears throat> so when I talk about enterprise design, I'm talking about a process of consciously, um, consciously crafting an enterprise or an organization or a business that's going to meet both you know, the practical needs of our context and those, those motivations and those driving ethics that we have. Um, so it's, it's a process of purposefully establishing the different aspects of the organisation, the different things, the different building blocks that make the project up. We think of um, the process of community-owned renewable energy project development um, as represented through this diagram. So you have your founding visions and values or your motivations, what you're hoping to achieve. They feed into and influence the way you design and structure these four key aspects in the middle. Um, as we've already spoken about in previous weeks, it's, um, those aspects are the governance structure, um, the financial arrangements, the technical structures, the technical aspects, and then what we'll talk about this week, which is the, the community engagement aspects. So we see those four aspects in the middle as the key building blocks of a community energy enterprise. Um, and then on the other side, just the recognition that there's a whole bunch of contextual factors that influence our project too. These are things to do with the policy and the regulation, the available resources, the, the nature of the communities we're operating in, that type of thing. So enterprise design is the process of um, feeding in, you know, feeding in our values, responding to our context, and designing those four aspects in the middle so they'll deliver the type of project that we want. As a way to visualize a core enterprise, um, you've got the overarching project. Underneath that, you have the four aspects. Um, each of those aspects is going to have different features. So in past weeks, we've talked about how economic arrangements um, are made up of things such as a share offer and um, a feature, another feature might be um, having applied for a grant and gotten funding for a grant. And another feature might be the fact that you have a lot of volunteer labor contributing to a project. Um, with governance structures, your features might be, one feature is probably your legal structure and your constitution. Another feature might be um, the way you've chosen to 
um, to allocate membership, who can be a member. Um, the technical features, which we haven't covered in this in this webinar series, but they're the things like what you know, what renewable technology are you using, and at what scale, and grid connection or batteries, all those sorts of things. So this week we'll be speaking through community engagement aspect and the different features of community engagement that different projects have chosen to take up in the design of their projects. I use um, I use this idea of the participation footprint as a method of analysing um, and visually representing what's going on in an organisation or in a project um, to do with the, the participation. So this, what this diagram is showing um, is four different projects. So each of the coloured lines represent a different project. Um, and the area contained within the colour line is a representation of how um, comprehensive or maybe not comprehensive um, the participation has been in that project. So the larger the footprint, the stronger um, and the more diverse and more sustained opportunities for participation have been through that project over time. The smaller the footprint, the weaker the participation. Um, so each of those um, arms of the spider web represent a different, a different feature of the enterprise design that relates in some way to the way that people participate. So what we'll be going through this week is the features of this web that relates to um, community engagement. So in previous weeks, we've covered off on the ones that relate to governance structures and economic arrangements, and this week we'll cover the ones that relate to community engagement practices. So I use this footprint um, as a way to visualise the difference between different design options that different projects have used. It's not, um, it's not, uh, necessarily, you know, about making judgment calls. It's just about being able to see the difference, see the difference that different decisions make on participation. So that really helps us to um, to consciously design our projects and thinking about our our project design in a comprehensive way because it maps out the influence of different decisions. So. Um, in previous weeks, we've talked about economic arrangements and the fact that um, there's a. This is basically about where money comes from and where money goes, um, and it can involve both monetary, like money-based contributions, as well as non-money-based contributions. So um, it covers off on things like investment and donations and grants, um, as well as things like volunteering and gifting and in kind. And together, for many projects, it's a diversity of economic arrangements that make them possible um, and make them viable and able to, to um, achieve their vision. So we talked through um, a, a range of ways that people participate in the economic arrangements of projects, um, such as becoming members and becoming shareholders, contributing their time as volunteers, contributing um, resources they might have, um, in kind and um, projects also contributing to, to the local economy through things such as local procurement. Last week we spoke about governance structures that community energy projects establish and we thought about them in terms of the formal governance structures which are things like your legal structure um, and different legal structures such as cooperatives and public companies and private companies and incorporated associations as being different options for, for formally and legally establishing the organisation. And within that legal structure, a lot of different decisions around, around um, who can be a member, who has voting rights, how decisions are made, um, what happens with the surplus, can it be distributed back to shareholders or does it all need to go towards a charitable purpose. All those things are governed through a legal structure. But there was also, um, we also spoke about extra legal elements. So things that are formalised, but they, they are beyond the legal structure. So things like policies and certifications and um, you know, memorandums of understanding with project partners and 
um, those types of things. And then, of course, our governance also is influenced by informal aspects to do with um, the culture of the culture and the values and the beliefs of the people involved and just the culture that's built up around the organisation. Um, so as I spoke about, the legal structure regulates many things and um, those things really influence the way, the sort of the parameters that are available for participation within a project. They set up things that the legal structure sets out and influences who, who can be a member, which influences you know who owns the project, who has how many votes, um, yeah, all of those different things that influence, um, yeah, many aspects of your legal structure influence and have implications for participation, and that's what we covered last week. So that was a very rapid recap. Um, do we have any questions at this point? No questions have come through in the Q&A session. I've got a question, which is, um, can you can you comment on, so the, the basis, the main body of knowledge that is the basis of your presentation comes from your thesis, from your PhD, plus obviously um, almost a decade of working in community energy. Um, can you comment on, the theoretical nature of this versus the practical nature? Does this stem from theoretical thinking or does it stem from practical um, uh, yeah, so experience? What, yeah, what led me to do a PhD was wanting to have time out to understand some of the patterns that I was seeing in the projects that I was working with across Australia um, and to understand how if we really want to achieve I'm really important in what happens in people's hearts and minds, you know, what happens in the community, in this community of people who get involved in projects, like those social outcomes, what, what, how do we achieve them, how do we influence them? So it was really that, um, you know, I'd come from being a project officer for a community-owned wind farm project that didn't end up going ahead for a variety of reasons, but I learned a lot in that process and I had a lot of questions. So that's what led me to the PhD. And really, I think I did it in as like drawing on as little theory as one possibly could in a PhD um, because I was really motivated. Um, you know, I went and spent two weeks with each of these case studies and I just wanted to see how their projects fit together, how they're, they're, they design their enterprises and how that influenced the types of outcomes and impacts that they were seeing in their communities. So I was really motivated to understand how, how we can do our projects more consciously and better. So I, I feel like um, it comes from a very practical orientation, although you know, I recognise it's still a PhD, so it has some theoretical elements. But I really like the way that theory and practice can inform each other and help us to see new depth and analyse new things in the way that we um, pursue our projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, questions come through, have you been influenced by the idea of commoning? And maybe without spending too much time answering the question, maybe you could also extend it to what are, the, what are your influences in coming to this research? So was that, um, have I been, been influenced by commoning? Yeah, the idea of um, creating a commons through the act of commoning. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So um, I, see, I see wind and solar and all renewable energy resources as part of the commons, that concept that, um, that it's a freely available resource that is, um, Every, it's everyone's right. No one owns it. You know, it's it's, it's a common resource. Um, and commoning is all about the idea that communities together um, care for and create value through managing and and caring for the commons. So I do see community energy projects as taking a, a, a common held resource, a freely available resource, and using that um, 
for the benefit of the community. So I do fundamentally see that as a process of commoning. Um, there's a whole literature on the commons and, and what um, caring for the commons means and, and how that's done. I didn't draw on that a lot in my thesis and that's really not because I wasn't interested in it, just because you start out with lots of ideas and you end up with, you know, focusing on a few. Um, I was, in terms of Tom's broader question, what theory was I influenced by? I was influenced by um, social enterprise theory, people who are thinking about, you know, in the past we've had this idea that of a dichotomy between for-profit business and not-for-profit charitable organisations. And social enterprise fits in the middle. It's about let's do business, but let's do it in a way that's motivated by ethics um, and by social and environmental motivations. So let's participate in the market, but let's also help recreate the market as we go. Let's help recreate um, the power structures of who has decision-making power over how the market runs um, at the same time as sort of being participants in that market. So I was influenced by social enterprise theory, um, but also particularly by some economic human geographers um, who, J, um, their name is J.K. Gibson Graham, and they do a lot of thinking about how how we can rethink the economy and how we can engage differently in the economy in ways that are going to um, live up to our ethical and moral um, motivations. And that see within within the scope of what currently exists, they see the diversity, you know, it's not just capitalism that's going on here, it's actually a whole range of economic practices that we can draw on, we can pick and choose the things that are going to meet our needs and meet our motivations best. Sorry, that felt like a long-winded answer, but yeah. No, it's really, it's really fascinating. Um, I, I, I guess um, we should crack on with the webinar and um, it's mostly going to be about the practical experience that you observed in the case studies. So, so let's let move on. No more questions. Cool. Okay. Lovely. So, um, community engagement activities. Um, although, like energy generation and energy production is largely an area now that communities don't have a lot of power in or a lot of involvement in. It's interesting to remember that in the past, you know, in the 1950s or pre-1950s, um, a lot of our energy generation was the responsibility of local government. Um, and so communities do have a history in owning and governing their own electricity, but we've largely sort of lost that um, over the past 70 years. And we're now in a process of um, reclaiming that ability to, to be involved and, and, and make decisions about our electricity generation and its implications. So really fundamental to doing that is um, thinking about who is the community that we're seeking to involve in this project um, and how are we going to provide opportunities for them to be involved and to be engaged in, in the process. And um, what I'm drawing on tonight is, you know, it's not a comprehensive list of every possible community engagement activity that you could do. It's just um, providing you with some ways of thinking about community engagement and some examples of community engagement to help exem exemplify the way it facilitates participation in our projects. So just some, um, all right, yeah, so the types of design questions when we're thinking about um, designing our community energy enterprises. When we're thinking about the community engagement aspect, we're thinking about things like who's involved, how are they involved, and how often are they involved. Um, so we're thinking about who the desired community is of the project. We're thinking about um, we're thinking about who's involved and how and, and what types of activities we engage in to reach out to people and to bring them in. Um, and and also ideally to help recruit them to participate in other aspects of the project. So just um, some definitions. Community, of course, 
is a pretty vague word. It's pretty fuzzy. It's a feel-good word that we all love, but it's, yeah, it's pretty vague. Um, and really, it can, it can mean lots of things, and that's okay. But it is really good when you're going about a community energy project to think about what you, as a group, what you mean by community. Who is the community that you're seeking to involve and benefit um, in your project? So, um, and being really clear about that and communicating that. So the two most common types of community that we see um, engaging with community energy projects, predominantly a geographic community. So, you know, a, a, a certain patch of a city um, such as, you know, West Sydney, um, or um, it might even be, you know, some of the community power hubs, for example, have worked with specific organisations. So it's like a, a, a type of sporting club. So it's really focused on not only within a town, but also an interest group within a geographic community. Um, but in the case of Hepburn Wind, you know, it was it was really focused on the local community of the Dalesford and Hepburn Springs area. Um, but the other really common community is a community of interest, those people who are just really strong advocates who really want to get involved um, in community energy. And often projects will combine the two that have a strong focus on ge geographic community. Um, in terms of community, it's also interesting to think about well, who, who are the types of actors that we include in our definition of community? Do, does local government qualify as part of the community? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. A lot of community energy projects, um, particularly overseas, are driven by local governments. Or local governments are a really important part. And, and projects like um, Farming the Sun in Lismore, so it's a, a, a partnership between the, the local council um, and a community energy group. Um, there's almost no dispute that local individuals are counted as part of the community and that local businesses are, but then what if it's a foreign-owned business but based in the local area? So there's all of these different possible actors within your community and um, there's no hard, fast answers, but it's good to be conscious about what you mean by community. In terms of what, what I mean by community engagement, um, you know, and this again, there's no single definition, but I use community engagement to refer to all of those activities that are undertaken with the intention of reaching out to the community of the project um, and, and to getting people involved. So you're reaching out to your existing members and keeping them involved, but you're also reaching out to new people and wanting to find ways to include them. So it's really um, about your your external facing activities. So the things that, that, that you know, what you present to the public or to the community. And, and um, so that includes things like communications, but it's also stalls and education events and um, forums and workshops and all those sorts of things. Um, but importantly, I think the purpose and the emphasis of these activities is to increase the contact between the desired community of the project and the project. So helping through that process to build relationships between people and the project and people and each other. Um, and it's those relationships that, that can become the foundation of trust um, and um, lead to you know, a whole bunch of outcomes to do with community building, but also things around um, building people's knowledge and capacity. Um, so I'll just read this quote because I think it's also an interesting point about community engagement. Um, it says, marrying the term community to the term engagement shifts the focus of engagement from individuals to the collective and to seeking development outcomes that consider the diverse needs that exist within any community. So community engagement is fundamentally about engaging people as a group and involving the collective in the project. So um, it goes beyond one-on-one -on -one interactions to also include group-based activities. Um, so just in terms of a way of thinking about the different, um, different types of community engagement activities, um, there's obviously 
communication elements. So these are these are one way flows of information. It's a one way engagement. So it's sort of the, the weaker end of community engagement, but it's really important. That's the foundation, um, really, that enables a lot of the other kinds of community engagement. So um, things like newsletters and social media and websites um, are all extremely common forms of communication used by community energy groups. But it's also um, outreach activities, so activities undertaken with the intent of getting people involved um, and providing two-way flows of information and that group-based um, interaction that I was talking about just before. So these are things like workshops and events and celebrations and, um, and forums. It might also be things like stalls where you know, you're, it's not necessarily a group-based interaction, but it's still a two-way flow, so it's a, you know, it's a conversation that, that happens. Um, and then there's also education and awareness raising activities. Um, and these are quite important for a lot of community energy projects because part of the, the motivation is to, to increase people's awareness of and knowledge of both energy efficiency and renewable energy. So that um, these types of community engagement activities include school programs and um, energy efficiency programs that reach out to households and all of those sorts of things. So in terms of um, the process that we go through to develop community engagement, I mean, sorry, community energy projects, um, there are some key steps. And those key steps are shown in the green boxes on the left-hand side. Um, we can think of them as being sort of an initial stage of starting the project, which we often call inception or you know project initiation. And during that stage, certain types of community engagement activities are going to make sense. And they're going to be activities that take it from take the community energy project from an idea held by one or two key people who you know got a bright spark and got really passionate to taking that to be a vision that's commonly shared by the community, by, by more people that really have the drive and the passion to take the project forward. So um, there's a whole range of engagement activities that might happen that are relevant for that stage. Um, and then as you move through the different stages through, you know, testing the idea in the community and what we call social feasibility through to the technical feasibility stage where, you you know, a lot of what you're doing is very technical, but there are ways to bring the community on board and, and, and bring the community along through that process. You know, and lots of community energy groups, for example, have done um, live data displays of, you know, if they're, if they're doing um, wind, Wind modeling, um, wind monitoring, for example, um, Denmark had a live data display of, of what what they were finding through having the anemometer up. Um, other projects might do sort of yeah photo montage or information um, available in a public space and that type of thing. And then as you move through to the planning phase, there's a bunch of you know specific community engagement activities that might make sense. And it will also depend on the type of project and the, particularly the scale of the project. Um, you know, if, you're, if you're developing a large multi-megawatt project that needs to go through um, the formal planning process, then this stage is probably going to involve seeking letters of support from your community and getting people to write submissions and making sure that people have as much information as they need and they have forums to ask questions and get questions answered. And, um, and then as you move on to raising the capital, raising the finance required for the project, then um, there's engagement opportunities that come along with your, your share offer, for example. Um, you're, you're really going to have to promote that to get the level of investment that you need. So you might be having stalls and public meetings and um, who knows, you might even do door knocking in the neighbourhood. And then as you move into construction and you know it's all happening, uh, sort of first starting to see the, the tangible, physical evidence of this project, then you're going to want to engage the community through that process as well. So being able to organise um, 
events that help people to see the construction progress safely from a distance, you know, with all required safety precautions, but to engage them in that process. Um, and of course, operations, you know, this goes on for 25 years, but how do you keep people engaged through that operation phase? How do you keep that connection live with your existing community, but also maybe with new people who, who become interested? Um, so things like open days and um, events on site, um, film nights or um, education programs with, with, with schools or tours of, of the site, as well as through, um, yes, yeah, your social media and your website and that sort of thing. So different activities will make sense at different phases, but there are community engagement activities that make sense through the whole life of the project. What you choose to do at different times will be based largely or in a really big way on what your motivations are um, for how people will be involved and how they will participate. And of course, you know, already be a little bit obvious, but there's overlap between the engagement activities that you choose to do at a certain time and the choices you've made around different economic arrangements and different governance structures and when it makes sense to get people involved to deliver those different aspects of your project. Just a nice little photo of some, some people in action. <laughs> so um, in designing our community energy projects um, and, and the community engagement aspect of our projects, we have um, a spectrum of options. This spectrum here is about thinking through who the desired community of the project is. Um, so who are the actors that we're seeking to involve? And as I said previously, you know, is it just individuals or are you okay with local business, but you draw the line at, at um, uh, foreign owned business that, lo that might be in the local area? Or, you know, how do you feel about local government? Are they in or out of your community definition? Um, and, and then also thinking about geographic scope. So there's a whole spectrum of, of options here. Um, and of course, what you decide in terms of who your community are will influence what your definition of members are in, um, that you include in your governance structure, in, you know, either in your constitution or in your policies. Um, and so on one end, we've got it totally focused on local individuals. Um, and this is, you know, this is a scenario where the most number of local people um, have direct involvement in the project and keep that project really grounded in a community of geography. Um, and on the other end, we have um, mem <coughs> members that aren't individuals and that, that aren't based locally and, and um, you know, therefore, the community definition of a project that would sit on that end is really rather questionable. Um, but this range in the middle, um, there's probably a whole bunch of, of different mix of people from different places and different types of actors that can genuinely be seen as a community project. But um, again, the important thing is being clear about what you mean by it. There's also um, another spectrum around community engagement, and that is thinking through um, how many people are involved and how often, um, and, and through those different efforts to engage people, how much influence do, do they have? And so this spectrum ranges from, on one end, um, engagement that starts early in the project, so from project initiation, from the very beginning, and it occurs often um, it gives people power and influence in the process. It really seeks to engage them in decision making. And it draws on a whole range of engagement methods through the life of the project. So that's the really strong end where participation is really strong. Um, on the very opposite end, we've got um, a scenario where community engagement occur, occurs very rarely and only by very limited means. So, you know, they might just um, do a newsletter once or twice a year and, you know, if they really need to run a, an information session just to make sure people are happy with the plans. Um, so this scenario is 
maybe I'm being a bit cynical, but it's quite common for corporate developers. Um, but then there's this whole range in the middle, and, and increasingly corporate developers are becoming more focused on thinking about the way they engage with communities. Um, and there is, of course, a spectrum of options in between the two. Cool. So that's sort of an overview of what I mean by community engagement activities. Is there any questions at this point? Um, <clears throat> there, there, there aren't really. Um, a couple of questions have come through which I've answered on the fly. One, one of them is uh, uh, really seeking feedback on, uh, uh, I'll read it out. Uh, I'm a member of a community engagement forum for an energy distributor. Next week, we are to con consider, quote, the AER is considering whether it would benefit customers to provide electricity distribution businesses, i.e. distributors, with an incentive to improve customer service. And really the question was, what suggestions would you have in terms of responding to that fairly open-ended question? AER is considering whether it would benefit customers to provide distributors with an incentive to to improve customer service. And I think, you know, my, my take on it is that AER should be thinking deeply about what it means to um, uh, uh, engage customers. And you're, you're a great example of someone who's been doing deep thinking about the way that community engagement is not a single dimensional question. Mm. Uh, I, I, I would suggest we probably don't need to answer that question. It's possibly too complicated. I guess um, where I'm approaching this webinar is, is sort of at the opposite end. So, you know, in this scenario that this person has presented, uh, a very large, um, you know, a regulator has um, set really, really clear and defined boundaries for how people can participate and there might be real value in doing that there there might be the ability to influence the outcome here um, and certainly I think you know having having opportunities for community you know whatever that panel is that's providing feedback that that's an important part of the process but it is also extremely limited um, you know it's it's saying here is your moment to have to participate in this process and what I'm getting what I'm hoping to help people think through is how do we create an opportunity through our project for participation to be ongoing and rich and meaningful um, and you know happen via a variety of means through our community engagement and through our legal structure and governance structure and through our economic arrangements so it's really taking <laughs> Taking a look from the other end of the spectrum, I suppose. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I personally find it really interesting that on the one hand, you've you've called community engagement one of the aspects that can be used if it was designed well to help ensure a desired level of community participation. They become quite separate in your model. Mm. Yet, yep. it's still it's still there's still a lot of confusion and overlap around what is, where is the boundary between engagement and participation? Um, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so do you want me to clarify that a little more? I, I do, but I'm also looking at the clock and we've got, let's call it 15 minutes to go and I think you're halfway through your slide deck. 45 minutes to go. 45, all right, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, so, only yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess just really, really briefly, community people do participate in community engagement, but they can also participate in a project via other means. So community engagement isn't the only way that people participate. So there is, of course, there's overlap because people do participate through community engagement activities. But um, but yeah, as we've seen in previous weeks. Participation is also built in through the other aspects. 
and through the way you design the other aspects of the project. Um, and this is partly why I define community engagement as external facing, as effort to reach out to the community and bring them in because a lot of the ways that people participate in a project are more internal. They're to do with the decision making and the voting and the, you know, having a shareholding and those things are more internal facing, if that makes sense. Whereas community engagement is hmm. external facing. Yeah, I think it makes perfect sense because it, it, for, for me it clarifies why there's confusion in my head. It's like, well, okay, you're talking about identifying who who is your important community to you as the group. Um, and it might be that who's important to you could be um, uh, invest, um, relatively wealthy investors because your theory of change might be that if we can get what relatively wealthy investors um, inspired to invest in these types of projects, then we can have an impact on the investment industry. Um, so. Um, th it's identifying that group and then engaging with them is a pathway to them with them participating in the in the governance dimension. Yeah. Or yeah, or the ownership the, through the ownership structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you got it. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Right. Let's move on. No <laughs> <other> questions. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. All right, so we'll um, talk through some case study examples now. Um, and, you know, as with the previous weeks, I'm drawing on these four case studies. Um, well, drawing predominantly on these four case studies. So, two of them likely very familiar to you Hepburn Wind in Victoria and Denmark Community Wind Farm over in WA. Um, but also two projects from Scotland, um, Chaplaincy Development Trust and Sky Renewables Corp. Um, I chose these four case studies because they were at a scale, um, so almost all of them have one megawatt or more. Um, they're at a scale where it was really able to, I was really able to um, easily see the, the outcomes and impacts from the project. Um, but also because these projects were all up and running and had been running for at least 18 months when I did my my field work. So they'd gone through the establishment phase, they were now in the operations phase, and I was able to look at, um, yeah, what 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 influence, you know, what different things they did through the different phases and how people were engaged and, and how people participated through um, through the different phases phases of a project. The four case studies vary a lot among between them. Um, so, you know, Hepburn Wind is a cooperative that has 2,000 mostly local members. Denmark Community Wind Farm is a public company with 116 members, again, most of whom are local people. Um, Chaplaincy Development Trust is a not for profit trust established for the purpose of. Um, Basically, they're a progress association or um, you know, develop, a local development organisation for their island, and they set up their project to um, to generate income for to, to deliver their charitable purpose. And the Sky Renewables Co-op is is again it's a co-op with local local people as the member shareholders, but they own just a 12% share of a larger um, a larger project, and they actually. You know they're invested in that larger project, but they didn't. They weren't involved in initiating or developing that larger project. So, what we see across these four is really different ways that people have been engaged in the project, from from the very beginning um, and through to the operations phase. Lots of variety and lots of difference. Um, and we'll see as we go through that um, that participation footprints as a result are really different. So um, just to give you a bit of an idea where we're going, I'll talk through um, I'll talk through most of the points that relate. To all, all of these um, points on the web relate to community engagement, and I'll talk through examples that will um, explain each of these and why the different projects fit where they where they do. Um, so the the project inception phase is really, you know, it's, it's that 
initial phase where you're setting up a project, um, you're just beginning. And, you know, one of the really important things is that where an idea comes from and how it's first introduced to people and who it's introduced by is a really important determinant of how people respond um, and how much support that gets in a local community and, and how how people are driven to, to get involved. Um, and we know that, you know, where it's local people and local passion driving a project, it's going to be a lot um, more effective at getting a local community on board and it'll have a foundation that feels really genuine to, um, to, that, to that place. So the project inception, different um, community engagement activities that happen at this phase usually are, um, you know, via, it might be surveys in the community to see, you know, a handful of people will have an idea that they want to set up a community energy project, but they won't. They don't know if other people are on board. So it's efforts to to go out and see what other people think about this idea. See how much. See, you know, does it have legs here? Is there enough support and interest to take it forward? So um, it might be doing a survey to see what other people in the community think and how much they'd be willing to invest under what conditions and what type of technology are they interested to see and um, all of those different types of things. But it might also be um, a, a community forum. Um, sorry, I've just noticed my laptop's not charging. And it's okay now. Um, you might have a community forum just to share the concept of community energy and share some of other people's, um, you know, what other people have done in other places to inspire your community to be involved. Community power agencies certainly done a lot of this all over Australia, helping share the stories and um, share share what it is that inspires people to get involved and, and that those types of forums followed by a workshop can be the impetus to kickstart a project. Um, in Hepburn, it was really interesting because their project started when a bunch of residents from Hepburn went across to the next Shire over to go to an information session for a very large wind farm that was being planned um, just, you know, just on the edge of, of their Shire, just beyond the edge of their Shire. And they were really disappointed because this company, you know, basically had all their plans in place and they were just telling people what they were planning to do in the communities. The people who were there were, were a lot of them were really concerned and, and shocked and feeling really uncomfortable about this, the idea of this wind farm. Um, and the group of people who'd gone from Hepburn were, were really concerned because they were really concerned about climate change and know that we need renewables, but they could also see that that way of involving people, that way, well, that way of not involving people, that way of engaging people in wind development is not particularly productive. And so they were motivated to do wind development differently, to do it in a way that really provided opportunities for people to get involved. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And because they had that motivation at the beginning, it's led them to have a real and ongoing emphasis on community engagement throughout the life of the project, throughout all of the phases of its development. Um, and I guess sort of on the other end of the scale, um, in Sky, in my case, the example from Sky, it was a corporate developer that did all, they made all of the decisions, they did all of the planning, and they really only did what was required of, you know, it was legally required for the planning process. Um, so they had a public information display, they had a public information session where people could come and get information, but it was, you know, it was really just the bare minimum of community engagement. Um, so the cooperative was only established and bought shares in the wind farm once it was actually up and running. They started talking about the idea earlier before construction started. But really the cooperative didn't, you know, they, they weren't engaged in that early phase of the project at all. So as a result, when you look at project inception, which is 12 o'clock, and also local involvement in setting the vision and the design of the project, which is 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock, um, Sky has a really, you know, sits towards the centre because there was very little um, community involvement in this phase. Whereas um, 
Uh, so Hepburn here, which is the blue line, is hiding behind the green line for, for a lot of a lot of this um, this web. So you just can't see it. But Hepburn, Chappancy, and Denmark, all the idea started in the community. It involved lot, you know, community engagement processes that, that brought people in and helped make sure the vision for the project and the, the, the initial design of the project was informed by local people. So they all perform really strong on those aspects. Um, another aspect of community engagement is, is seeking input and allowing for group deliberation. So the idea that getting using community engagement to get input that is going to influence the project um, is is really important and it's an aspect where your community engagement overlaps with your governance structure. So the the input you're seeking through getting people involved through community engagement feeds into your decision making. Um, but the other really important element here is, is allowing for group deliberation or group discussion. So you're not just reaching out to one-on-one -on -one people and having one-on-one -on -one chats, you're allowing the community to come together and to nut it out together. And this builds um, layers of understanding for why things are the way they are, but it also builds layers of um, relationship and trust. When people, you know, in that definition, that quote that I introduced earlier, marrying the term community to the term engagement is fundamentally about having opportunities for the group um, to participate together as a group. Um, so, yeah. This aspect of community engagement involves dialogue, conversation, um, and the opportunity for negotiation, and that's that's really important. Um, so, examples of this, um, both Chappancy Trust and Hepburn Wind have gone through cycles through the through the project, through the phases of the project. You know, they've done surveys of their membership. They've had forums and workshops to nut out particular issues. Um, they've had opportunities for people to vote, and not just the people on the board or the members. But Chappancy, for example, they they really wanted to make sure that the whole island, they gave the whole island the opportunity to vote about whether the project should go ahead. So first of all, they sent out letters to everyone and they had a um, public forum for people to ask questions and to discuss things and make sure they understood the project. And then they held a vote to make sure that they, because they really wanted a clear and provable remit from their whole island community that people wanted to go ahead with this project. Um, and so they held an island vote and they had a, a threshold of, um, it was 70 percent, but they needed 70 percent support to proceed, um, and they got that, and they went ahead. But they were willing to step away from the project and not proceed if they didn't get the level of support that they were looking for. So that's just um, just one example, and um, I think it's really important to to remember that you know although that vote was a moment in time, engagement isn't just about doing it once and getting yeah, getting a stamp of approval or get getting a social license. It's actually an ongoing process. Um, a social license is something that you have to continually maintain and work at. It's not it's not a moment in time. It's it's throughout the project. Um, and it's that idea that that of bringing people along on the journey um, and and doing that through um, through a variety of engagement practices. So when we look at um, the features that relate to having ongoing, so throughout the life of the project, different opportunities for deliberation and group-based decision making, um, that's at three o'clock. And we see, we see that Shappancy does really well, because um, I should mention, you know, not only did they do that, that early work, but now um, they regularly have um, a community process whereby um, people 
provide input into how the surplus generated through the project, how the profits from the project gets used within the community. Um, so the community helps to set the priorities for funding um, and that's, that's been an ongoing process. Hepburn Wind as well has provided ongoing opportunities for group decision making and an example of this is the surveys that they do of their membership asking for really important input into really important decisions like should we prioritise paying a return to our members or should we prioritise paying down our debt so that we have less risk, we're holding less risk as a project. Um, and the board took recommendation, took the recommendation from that survey of their members. Um, in Denmark, they did less um, group-based decision making, particularly after the very the early inception phase of the project. There really hasn't been much ongoing opportunity for that other than at the ADM. Um, and in Sky, again, like, yeah, there really wasn't was an opportunity for this and certainly was an opportunity for that group, that input to have a significant influence on the project. Um, in terms of information sharing and communications, um, this is, yeah, sort of a baseline for community engagement. It's the, a, a very important, necess a necessary minimum, I guess you could say. But a lot of your other forms of engagement um, aren't going to be possible unless you've got good ways of communicating with the people you're trying to communicate with. Um, so the, the communications, different communications approaches by different community um, energy projects vary a lot. They vary in terms of the different methods used, um, how many different methods are used. So, you know, from um, website, social media, newsletters, engagement with local news and print media. Um, so how many different methods they go about communicating. It can also be things like posters and flyer drops and letter drops and um, but also the regularity. So how often how often it happens. Um, you know, is it once a year, is it once a month? Um, and also what level of transparency is there? You know, do you publish your minutes? Of every meeting, um, do you make it easily accessible to see your constitution, um, or is the information you provide more polished and targeted, and trying to present a certain image and not the whole picture? Um, yeah, so lots of lots of variety there. Um, in Shackensy, for example, they they do a monthly newsletter, and they started this when. They were leading up to construction phase and they felt like there was just there was a lot of updates that they needed to be getting out there and make sure everyone knew. But they actually do a, a printed newsletter that goes out to every resident's mailbox on the island. Um, but they also realized, look, this is a lot of work and a lot of resources. And we only don't we only need to say this much, we've got you know a whole page. And they turned it into a community newsletter that's actually now a really, really important community asset where people get a lot of the information about what's going on in the community. And um, so that's sort of one extreme. Not very many community energy projects would go to that extent. But I guess, um, you know, other examples are that are much more common are having social media and having a website and having a quarterly email newsletter, for example. Um, and that's still, that's a lot. That's a lot of engagement. Um, so when we look at um, the indicator that relates to this, it's at five o'clock and it's looking at um, the quality, the frequency and the reach of the information. Um, and both Hepburn Wind and Chaffinsey have performed well there because they, they both are regular um, and they both have a really high level of transparency where they're really trying to, to communicate a lot about the realities of the project and they're being really open with their members about what's going on. Um, and Denmark further in, you know, they they issue a couple of communiques a year to their members, mostly related to their AGM and the, you know, the financial statements. Um, but beyond that, you know, there might be a media story every now and then, but it's, it's really quite minimal. Um, and similar with Sky, but, um, oh well, no, actually they don't even have a newsletter. <laughs> um, 
yeah, so it's just a range there and you can see that, that it affects the participation footprint. Um, in terms of events and celebrations, this is really, um, when I was speaking to people who are involved in, in the project, um, when I was interviewing people, and I asked them, you know, what's something that stands out for you? Almost everyone said, or everyone commented on having, everyone commented on being at some type of event or celebration, um, and usually the launch event for the project. Um, so these are a really important moment, um, and they're not to be underestimated in, in your community engagement, your, your suite of community engagement activities, because they play a really important role in consolidating that sense of ownership and that sense of community. Um, and bringing people together so that they can build connection and relationship with each other and with the project. Um, and importantly, it, it tells the story. Um, it helps people, people who are already involved and who are members. It's that sense of, yes, we did this and we did it together. Look what we achieved. Isn't this awesome? Celebrate your moment. Celebrate what you've done. And for other people, it's that chance to sort of feel the vibe and get excited and, and um, and understand what's going on inside this project. So um, this might take lots of forms, um, you know, launch events, site tours, festivals on site. Um, Hepburn Wind, for example, they, they held quite an impromptu picnic um, in the next paddock over where they could see at a safe distance, see the turbines going up. Um, similarly on Chapman Day, they had an impromptu vigil uh, the night the turbines arrived. And, you know, Chapman is in the far north of Scotland. The weather's usually really crappy. Um, and it was cold. I think it was raining. Um, the, the boat with the turbine parts arrived at midnight. And people were just there lining the streets and, um, you know, sharing an impromptu whiskey and, and um it was a really exciting moment in the life of the project where they, they finally saw the manifestation of everything they'd been working towards. Um, other things that different groups have done, um, naming competitions, opening, you know, ribbon cutting ceremonies in the Lismore Farming the Sun project, they had an oversized PowerPoint that they, they plugged together, um, you know, all sorts of creative things that, that can be done to um, help tell the story of the project and bring the community of people together. Um, and, you know, Hepburn Wind, of course, has done some really great events at, at the wind farm, um, including getting artists to paint murals on the turbines. And those murals are, tell the story not only of the project, but also of how it relates to the local environment. Um, and, and why it's important and it helps to give the turbines um, a relatable identity. You know, it helps demystify and break down the technology. And I think that's a really, you know, things, events like site tours are really important because a lot of, um, we can't underestimate the power of allowing people the opportunity to just engage with the technology one-on-one -on -one if they're concerned about it. Go and see it for yourself. Go and feel it for yourself. And, you know, really that's, that's the most powerful thing that you can do to help people feel comfortable um, with the technology. So in terms of how this relates to the participation footprint, um, looking at six o'clock there, the frequency of celebrations, events and tours. Um, historically, Hepburn Wind's done a lot of these. They, they host a whole bunch of tours at their wind farm, including, you know, international groups and groups of politicians, but also local school groups and other um, people from other community energy groups who, who want to go and check it out. Um, Chaffancy has sort of not done so great on the celebration front. They've had a few events. Um, you know, they, they actually set up a community garden at the base of their turbines. That was really sweet, but they haven't been so good at celebrating, consciously celebrating their successes, which I do think has been a bit of a shame, other than that impromptu gathering at the wharf. Um, and, and it has, I saw it having implications for people 
the people I interviewed, their willingness to claim the success of their project um, and their willingness to, and it might be cultural as well, you know, that, that idea of not wanting to boast about your achievements. But um, there, there was, I do think that celebrations help people claim what they've achieved together and that's really important. Um, Denmark and Sky perform less, just that they've, they've had less events. Both of them did have launch events. Um, and involved local school kids in, in naming the turbines and in, in um, officially opening the wind farm. So that, that was really great. Um, yeah. So, time check, okay. Um, another important aspect of community engagement is to do with education initiatives. So, conscious efforts to, um, to raise people's awareness and, and understanding of not only renewable energy, but also the electricity system and how it operates and um, energy efficiency and the way you use electricity. And this, um, this occur occurred across all of the case studies and um, it is really common, I think, a, a lot of community energy projects start with um, an interest in energy efficiency. And we may not talk about it all the time, but I think this is one thing that community power hubs have done really well is um, working with their project partners to, to understand the energy use and to identify energy efficiency opportunities um, that relate to not only, you know, um, implementing uh, retrofits, um, so, so new, you know, changing the lighting, for example, um, but also understanding how their behaviour is important and, you know, if you install a, a solar system on the roof, how you can modify your behaviour to make the most of that solar system, to make to be using the electricity when you're producing it so that you're achieving the best cost outcome um, from, from the system. So that's something that um, the community power hubs have done really well across many of their projects. Um, with, with wind farms, it's a bit different because the relationship's less direct. You know, you haven't got solar on your roof. Um, and you can't use it behind the meter. But nonetheless, um, all of these projects have done education and awareness, well, with the exception of Sky, have done um, awareness raising and education programs, and usually that involves schools um, and, and tours to the, to the wind farms. Um, but Denmark in particular did a really broad community-wide energy efficiency program working with um, a local sustainability group as well as the state network company because they they are located at the end of a very long and very spindly arm of the grid and experienced quite a lot of um, blackout issues. So they were really looking to um, control their electricity demand so they could reduce the number of blackouts. Um, and they were really successful in that initiative. They were able to reduce um, reduce electricity demand by 14% and then with the wind energy generation coupled with that then they were able to, um, they haven't caught up on the news in the last couple of years but certainly for the, four, the first four years of operation of the wind farm they didn't experience any blackout. So it can be really powerful, um, a really powerful way to engage people in the project in the way that builds the links between what happens in their home and their choices and their behaviour um, and the project and the broader context of an importance of thinking about energy. So here we're looking at seven o'clock, um, the emphasis on creating education opportunities and um, Hepburn and Chappensee in Denmark all, you know, doing, doing quite a lot there, um, but Sky not so much. So the last one I'll talk through is, is an import, important element. Um, part of what we need to know how to do when we're developing community energy projects, especially if they're larger scale projects, um, you know, be that hydro, wind, solar. But we need to be able to have that conversation with people who are concerned about the project. We need to know how to engage respectfully and productively with opposition. Um, and this can be tricky, it's really hard as a community member thinking that you might piss some people off or that they might not like what you're proposing. Um, but all of the case studies that I looked at had found ways of engaging with people who had concerns 
um, productively and and most often being able to shift people towards being accepting of the project at a minimum and sometimes through to being supportive, actively supportive of the project. And really some of the keys to this are making sure your community engagement is perceived to be fair and genuine. One of the things that influences this is the relationship between what you say you do um, and what you do in practice. So if you say that people can have input into certain decisions, you need to follow through on that and um, take that input on board and feed it into your formal decision making processes and then report back on how that input fed into your decision making processes. Um, so other things like that contribute to perceptions of fairness are around um, allowing the people who are going to be impacted or influenced by the project to have a say in the project um, and to have an op and this doesn't mean they have to make the decision themselves but to have the opportunity to be heard um, and to be genuinely um, listened to and to have their perspective considered and often just listening and acknowledging someone's point of view is enough or is is a really important first step to opening up the dialogue. Just recognizing, just recognizing how they're feeling. Not you know, not you don't have to agree with it, but just 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 acknowledging it. And I think the important thing to remember is that change in much loved landscape can be difficult. You know, change is humans are often really resistant to any form of change, but you're more able and more willing to accept change if you've had some influence in the change that's happening. You've had some level of ability to um, yeah, to influence the change and if you're benefiting from the change. And this is a lot of what um, you know we've spent a lot of time working with the large scale wind industry, trying to help them recognise these points. And that's partly why we're seeing more initiatives around um, community co-investment where you know allowing communities to co-invest in wind farms and wind farm wind and solar big large wind and solar farms thinking about how they can share the benefits of the project with the local community. Um, and there were some really, really heartwarming stories um, from my research about um, people who'd gone from having concerns and even being vocally oppositional to over time through face to face engagement, through keeping the door open and keeping the conversation going, able to shift their position to being supportive. Um, and just as an example, like Hepburn Wind has 60 neighbours within two and a half kilometres of the wind farm. That's a high density neighbourhood really for a wind farm, it is. Um, and um, they have an extremely high level of support from within that neighbourhood. And most people within that neighbourhood um, are shareholders of of the project, they offer they offer everyone within the neighbourhood the um, a thousand shares in the project, and most people have taken that up. So they're they're co-owners and beneficiaries um, from the wind farm. So when we look at um, uh, eleven o'clock, there reported sense that opposition has been managed fairly and respectfully. Um, this did happen for most of the projects, um, but again, you can see how how all the different choices that around community engagement that the projects have made, all those different choices have influenced the type of participation footprint they have, um, and influenced, yeah, whether it's stronger or weaker. No question. Sorry. Um, yeah, we have a question. Um, are there any ideas on working with existing commercial opposition? Um, do you mean, uh, do they mean opposition to commercial projects? Or do they mean mm -hmm. opposition from commercial entities? Uh, I don't know. Let's propose what, what if you write this, answer, this question, we can clarify that for us, please. Let's propose that what they mean is competition. Sorry? Competition is the answer. Competition? 
yeah, any any uh, ideas on how to work with existing commercial entities where you might be taking their customers? Oh. Oh, that type. Okay. Um, so there might be there might be a local business, for example, um, mm. or they might not be a local business, but they might have a lot of customers, and they can perhaps influence local sentiment. Mm. I don't know. That's a tricky one. I've not actually thought about that before. I guess. Um, mm. If it's another, if it's a, a company or an organization from within the community, I would try to engage directly with them face to face and see if there's a way of working it out or work, possibly even working together and being stronger together. Mm. If they're from outside of the community and they're a large corporate, I just go full power ahead and bite out their market share. <laughs> yeah, ma manage manage their comms uh, to to people yeah, in your community. Yeah, manage comms, but like mm. build your community support for your local project, and that yeah, you know, that's legitimate. That's fine. Yeah, and I guess I guess it's not it it doesn't come naturally to community groups to think about being competitors. It, it comes naturally to think about being collaborators. Mm. But that doesn't mean that competition doesn't sometimes exist, and sometimes you need to have strategies to counter what could be described as competitors and the strategies yeah. that they'll be using against you. But I think if you're both community organisations operating in the same patch, like you just need to try to figure out how to work together. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Collaboration is what it should be about. And it's one of the great benefits of not being a for-profit is that you can have much more free reign to have those t types of conversations. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. No. No other questions. Um, I'll hold back on asking any questions because um, I think we've still got a bit of a recap to do. Is that right? Yeah. So look, I just I just quickly wanted to do a bit of bringing it all together, um, a bit of a, a series summary. Um, so we've spoken about lots of different ways that people can participate in community energy projects. Um, and through the footprints, we've been able to analyze how different choices around enterprise design influence the degree to which people participate in the, in the project overall. Um, and the key to generating strong participation and a, a larger, represented by a larger participation footprint, is to build in forms of participation that are sustained over time. So through the various stages of the project, the, through the whole life of the project, to build in participation that involves groups of local people, so it's that, that group-based dimension that is deliberative and collective, um, and that build in participation that has a significant influence on the project, so that gives people power in the process um, and, and allows their participation to have a genuine impact in the shape and the form of the project. Um, and to build in participation that is diverse, that occurs across the three aspects of the project that we've that we've talking about, talked about through this series. So um, you're, you're going to have stronger participation if you have designed a project that allows for participation over time by groups of people, um, that influences the project and that is diverse. And where this happens, um, that's where you really get strong social outcomes. So, you know, we know that not all social outcome, outcomes are present in every core project, but my research really clearly indicates that enterprise design affects participation and participation in turn affects the range and the depth of the social outcomes that you see in a project. And those social outcomes are stronger and more diverse where your participation is deeper. So what I found ultimately, sort of in a nutshell from my research, was that there's a correlation between diverse, sustained and meaningful opportunities for participation and the strength to which my the, the research participation research participants reported things about, you know, having in an increased sense of empowerment or 
um, a, a stronger sense of community or a stronger sense of um, a positive association with the turbine technology or, or more skills and, and that sense of, of capacity. Um, so all of those social outcomes were stronger where participation was, was deeper or stronger. Um, and so, you know, in, in conclusion, I really want to encourage you to, to think about the ways we can build in participation because participation is going to be the foundation of the social outcomes from your project. Um, and it's that participation that really enables people to, to build the connections with the project and with each other that lead to things like capacity building and empowerment and community building. Um, and that, of course, has the ability to transform not only who people, how people see the project and how they relate to the project and how much they support and want to be involved in the project, but it also influences how they see themselves and how they behave as people, um, as participants in energy change, in broader systems change. Um, so it influences the way they then act in their homes, the way they might engage with the politics around renewable energy, um, the way they might become involved in other aspects of change making to do with energy. Doesn't happen every time, but it is. it occurs more often where participation is strong. So thank you very much for joining us for this webinar series. Um, all of the webinars are available on the Coalition for Community Energy and the Community Power Agency website. We'd really love your feedback about this series, um, or I really would. Um, it's the first time that I've run it, and um, if, if you've registered for the webinars and we have your email addresses, we're going to send you just a really, really short evaluation survey and, and if you do have any comments or feedback we'd really appreciate it. Um, you can also just email me um, and yes, yeah, that would be really great. I have received a couple of emails and I've, I've really appreciated the feedback. It's been really valuable, so thank you. Just um, to note that the, those videos are also available on the Community Power Hub web, website. Oh great, sorry, on the Community yeah. Power Hub website as well, great. As well, yeah. Um, so there are a few more workshops in this series um, sponsored by S Sustainability Victoria and the Community Power Hub. Um, they are face-to-face -face workshops that will require you to register um, and there'll be limited, limited availability for those. Um, Sustainability Victoria is going to send notice to these around tomorrow, I believe. Um, and again, if we have your email, because you've registered for this webinar series, we'll be able to send you the information about these upcoming workshops as well. And that's it. Thank you, Jenna. Um, a couple, couple of comments coming through as saying, saying thank you from participants as well. Um, I will post the links to those workshops you just mentioned in the chat. Um, I'm just going to stop recording now, so if you want those immediately, you don't want to wait until you've been emailed, um, hang around and I'll, I'll get those in there. So thank you very much, Jara.